a quick poll for everyone. I'm going to open it right now. Let me share on the screen so everyone can see the poll uh, over there. So let us know if you think you understand what operationalizing your data means. And uh, we will get to that question uh, right after my introductions. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Let me close this and get my slides. All right, so we are here today to talk about operationalizing your B2B data today uh, with this amazing panelist. I'm so excited about it. But before we um, jump into content in, uh, on the five expert tips on how to grow your pipeline with this awesome panelist, I need to introdu introduce you to Modern Sales Pros. Today's event is brought to you by the team at Modern Sales Pros. And for those of you not familiar with Modern Sales Pros, we are the world's largest and highest quality community for those in sales management, sales leadership, sales and revenue operations, and sales enablement, aka our Modern Sales Pros. And our mission is to create an environment for our members to answer the toughest revenue questions out there. And we have 30,000 members, and with that amount of people helping you, I'm pretty sure no answers will be left, no questions will be left unanswered, and no problems will be left unsolved. And we do that through uh, our robust forum, those live sessions like this one you're about to experience. We also are coming back to in-person events, and we have quarterly summits. We just had a summit back in October. It was fantastic. We pulled out uh, 24 events of amazing content and speakers. You can hear from CEOs from great, great, great companies. I am going to put a uh, link in the chat right now so you can get all the recordings and you don't miss out the amazing content. But for right now, let's focus on this session here. This panel is being recorded, so you will be able to access the recording in the MSP previous events page in our website. And also, uh, please ask a lot of questions. We have two specialists in here to help you operationalizing your data. So ask them a lot of questions using the Q&A panel right on your right hand side and also the chat, this, uh, the public chat. So let, let's send them a lot, a lot of questions. Uh, they love answering questions. Um, and one more thing, MSP does not work alone. We have amazing, amazing sponsors. And today this panel is sponsored by the fantastic Sales Intel. I have James in here. Uh, from Sales Intel. So I am going to pass the mic uh, to James. Uh, James, you can introduce us to Sales Intel. Tell us what you're doing, uh, what the amazing job we're doing over there, and also introduce yourself and then uh, introduce our guest panelist, and then we can start things. What What do you think? Sounds good. And I'll let Ed also introduce himself and, and Open Prize, who are a great partner of ours, and I'm happy and really uh, pleased that he was able to join us. So, so Sales Intel, we provide the industry's highest quality B2B sales intelligence data, including technographics, contact data, intent data, um, basically everything you need um, to jumpstart and fuel your go-to-market pipeline and, and, and conversion. Um, we are um, uh, most proud of the quality and the way we manage quality. Um, very different in the market from a lot of their players in that regard. Um, and I am James Lamberti, the CMO. I was a customer turned CMO with a passion for data. And so I'm glad to be here. Been here about 10 weeks and really happy to be back with Modern Sales Pros and MSP. You may, some of you may remember the webinar I did um, probably going back uh, maybe two or three weeks. And I mentioned that Ed and Open Prize would be joining us to double click on the data, which is the heart and soul of it. Ed, I would love for you to introduce yourself and Open Prize, and then we will get going. Yeah, I'll keep it short. Uh, my name is Ed King, CEO and founder of OpenPrice. OpenPrice is a uh, no-code, full-stack data orchestration and uh, automation cloud designed specifically for the robust builders. We help you uh, get your data in shape as well as automate your uh, all your back office processes in go to market and uh, deliver self-service capabilities to your property. Excellent. Um, cool. Well, we're going to jump in. As you have questions, again, throw them into the chat for um, Eduardo to sort of uh, manage. And at the end, we'll have a few minutes and we'll take a few, we'll answer a few questions um, at the end. But jumping right in, today's session, five expert tips to grow pipeline efficiently, how to operationalize your B2B sales data. Um, so we talked a lot, uh, if you were here in the last uh, webinar we did with MSP, about the importance of pipeline generation being a team sport. And I'm really, really happy to have Ed. He was pretty modest in his intro, but this is a, a guy in a company who spent his entire career and started a company just to solve this problem. So 
I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, 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 I'll mention that. So I want to hand it first to Ed to define what do we mean by operationalizing data? Those are big words, sort of a flowery marketing language, but I love your definition and the pragmatic way you explain it. So take us through what we mean. Yeah. So, you know, well, James, right? In marketing, people says, uh, you know, you got to use what, a fifth grade language. So <laughs> we tend to do it here. So yes, operationalized data, big word. Let's boil it down to a fifth grade language. Uh, this is a simple framework I like to use to think about this. It has three parts. And make it good, make it yours, and make it usable, right? And, and it goes in that sequence. And let me just quickly touch on what this each one means. So at the beginning, I mean, at a very foundational level, you got to make it good. So this talks about the, the basic quality and governance of data, right? And make sure the data is actually trustworthy. So if you don't have good quality data, frankly, nothing else matters because everything else builds on good quality data. And, and I don't know how many times I hear from our prospect and customer that I, we, we ask them, what's the top challenges you have? They're like, our CMOs or our CXOs just don't trust the data we have, right? So because when there's no trust, you don't know what report and metric means. So first of all, you got to get that basic hygiene done. We'll, we'll drill down to that today. So once you have good quality data, so this is the, so it basically is accurate, it's, you know, it's recent. And uh, now the second thing is make it yours, right? So because it's all about how you leverage that market uh, data to go to market. So if you're just storing like generic data, uh, you know, may not be that helpful or maybe kind of painful to, uh, to, to, uh, to make a use of it. So this is really then take the data you have and really start combining with your first party data potentially with second party data if you got partners, third party data like uh, data from like sales intel and also open data. There's a lot of actually public domain data out there that may be relevant to you. And this is all about that adding the proper business context to support your go-to-market. And probably easiest if I just quick, give a quick example. One of the companies that we work with, they're in the internet of things business, right? So for example, they target companies like Coca-Cola and New Jersey Transit Authority. Now, most data sources will tell you Coca-Cola is a food and beverage company, and the New Jersey Transit Authority is a transportation company, right? And however, this IoT company, the only in reason they're interested in those two companies is because they have smart vending machines. So in their database, they have a custom industry called smart vending machines. So part of the data management program actually maps all these, uh, you know, the, the raw source data into a custom industry. And this really kind of adds that, you know, uh, that flavor about has how actually they require data to support their go to market. The third one is make it usable. So, you know, you can have perfectly good, rich data, context rich, but still can be very difficult to use. And so the last part is really, how do you make this data, whatever data you have, make it usable to the different uh, stakeholders that need to consume the data. And this usually involves a lot of personalization and also make sure the data is actually accessible. And that we'll talk a lot about as well as I just, in this day and age, it's still amazing how, uh, you know, how difficult it is actually to access good data. And I'll give you another good example, kind of explain what this is. So, you know, in most contact profiles, we have job title, a very nice, rich piece of data. However, because it is unstructured data, and also, you know, people get creative with their job titles, right? Uh, so Silicon Valley here, for example, for a while, Growth hacker, or data ninja, were like you know cool titles. So what what exactly is growth hacker? Right? So for example, it's really somebody in marketing, and probably in a demand gen job, and is probably a senior manager or direct level person, right? How do you translate into that, and and that's much more usable in terms of help you with list building and targeting than just growth hacker. So so James, that's kind of the the, the base for framework. I usually like to think about it, right? Make it good, make it yours, and make it usable. Yeah, I love this framework. And I would say that I, you should ask yourself this question, but when I uh, interact with, and in my even in my own experience as, as, as um, joining growth stage companies, I think people often land right away and make it usable. And then um, that foundation isn't set, right? That's, I think, the key thing I would encourage you all to think about. If you just go straight to make it usable as a bunch of individual people and functions, then make it yours, make it good, or sort of skipped over and that foundation isn't set. So I love the progression 
is what I would call out from Ed's advice. Now, jumping in, now that we've established that de de definition, we're going to go through five, five expert tips, like we promised, right? And, and each of those tips is going to be um, a discussion around five minutes each on the data and its value, how you operationalize it, and then a couple of stories, real stories, like the ones Ed just shared with you. Um, some will be best practices, some will be gotchas, things that we've seen before that cause problems and we want to warn you, um, but that's that's it, right? And so we're going to start with um, number one is the data definition of your relevant market, right? So think about Ed's definition. That is foundational, right? Foundational. And I'm, I'm guessing a lot of um, companies haven't even set that foundation. ABXing your pipeline growth, the, some people call it all bound, but sort of ending this discussion around inbound versus outbound and getting to all bound or ABX, right? Hygiene, hygiene, hygiene. Um, this is where I think Ed is a particularly expert and has a lot of um, great work he's done. So that data hygiene and how that can uncover movers data or job changers and how important that is in this environment. And then finally, we land on aligning around what we call the demand center when you, going back to Ed's definition, when you've built that foundation along those three steps, um, your, how your team can then operate together fundamentally changes for the better. So those are the five we're going to go through. And I'm going to start with the uh, number one, which is data define your addressable market. Um, this is a real live example, right? This is real data. This is a segment or a, uh, 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 that, that we care about. It sells Intel. I'll use I, uh, as... As the CMO at Sales Intel, this is an example of how I use Sales Intel every day. So number one is the data and its value. And what we are faced with today is the, the fact that we have firmer, and sorry for the formatting uh, mix up here, but we've got in that first bucket, we have firmographic data, right? And in this case, it, it's a US market only, 11 verticals, company size of five to 100 million, right? I then move to that next bucket with just technographics. I care about three key technographics, right? Ed had mentioned, um, you know, the the vending machine software and automation, right? That is a technographic definition of what Coke and the New Jersey Transit Authority care about. That's a great example of a technographic CRM marketing option automation and cadence tool. Now I've gone from twenty two thousand five hundred companies down to fifteen thousand, uh, call it two hundred and fifty companies. I then know I care about four personas, sales leaders, marketing leaders, rev ops leaders, customer success leaders. I can use defined metadata like Ed described, or I can enhance that with searchable queries, like get the growth hackers, for example, aligned into that. Now I know there are 15,257 companies with about 100 and call it 60,000 relevant contacts I've identified, 30,000 of which are decision makers, right? I've got a really tight circle drawn around this particular part of the addressable market. I multiply that times my ACV and I find that I've got a $760 million relevant market, but very clearly defined. This type of work is now entirely possible um, but I'll, I would encourage you all to ask yourself on a daily basis, do you know, for every one of the key segments in your addressable market, do you know how many companies, how many contacts, and do you have a really clear idea of the market size? So now I'll turn it over to Ed, who's going to go through how it is using this rubric, how it is we operationalize this. Yeah. So and again, this framework, you can apply to almost uh, any problem, any use case. So, and let's, let's go through a couple of you know, this example here. So when you talk about make it good, right? So this is, uh, again, uh, you know, at a sales kickoff, imagine you can tell your sales team, hey, basically every account you possibly want to talk to, right? And all the relevant contact at each one of these accounts is already populated in your CRM, right? You should, we, we can minimize the time people have to go Hunt and peck because you already built out that great data set, so you have a good data set. And, and also, this look beyond, you know, again, all the sources that you have, right? So, uh, obviously, your first party data is, is awesome, right? And we want to have a great third party uh, data sources like Sales Intel, but also don't look at the, if, if it's relevant to your market, it's stuff like open data, right? For example, uh, any company that sells, for example, uh, has a 401k program or a uh, 
you know, workers' comp insurance, they have to actually register uh, their program with the Department of Labor using a form called Form 5500 data set, right? So if you sell insurance, if you sell workers' comp, you sell 401k advisory services, for example, your entire total adjustable market, including stuff like asset under management data, is actually in that Department of Labor Form 5500 data set. Now, that data set is public domain. It is not easy to get to and make, make it operational, but it's there. And so don't overlook you know, other, all the different sources that you can uh, make your data really good. And then let's talk about you know, make it yours. So for example, and again, it's all about different audiences and what a context you need, right? So for example, if you sell to the, uh, if you have either your entire company or part of your company sell to the US federal government, which you know usually work with partners, partners so you probably want to enrich it with uh, kind of the, the partnership information that you have so you know you're, who you're working with there. Or uh, you know, in our own case, for example, at Open Price, we're a platform that does a lot of different use cases. For us, use cases is important, right? What has customer already used your product for and what are the white spaces or opportunities that they can, they can potentially use your product for? So those are all kind of information that we append to our own account data to understand you know, what a customer is doing and what they have the potential to use. That's also, again, uh, kind of build up this kind of broader definition of addressable market. And the, uh, the last one is I'll really, uh, again, uh, make it usable, right? So, uh, you know, you got to be able to present this addressable market data in a way that's easy for the, uh, for the, uh, uh, for the sales team and the marketing team to leverage. And, and <laughs> give you actually one uh, kind of, actually kind of a horror story. Uh, we should keep their name, uh, uh, you know, well, I'm not going to mention the name because it's kind of embarrassing for them. So, you know, this, this is a company that's been around for a long time, uh, has all data from a large number of, uh, of, of, of vendors, all the way back to uh, 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 the, uh, you know, Discover Org and kind of the, the age. So the, the when, we, when they're still often engaged with the first time, then, and they keep on complaining that they don't, they couldn't route their leads properly because they route based on industries and company size and they somehow just don't have accurate data for that. In fact, they told us that in their Salesforce and Marketo environment, the fill rate for those two fields is less than 10%. So they can't route. Then when we first uh, crack open their database and start looking at it, it says, wait a minute, you have 10 industry fields, six full emails and, 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 uh, and eight set of addresses for every contact record. This is because they, you know, they, uh, you know, after they buy all these data, they never actually bother to merge them and build that golden record. And they, they never digest the data into their, their core fields. And while so people keep on acquiring data, but nobody ever done the work to make sure it's actually usable. And if you go into their Salesforce, and you guys probably seen this, there's panels and panels of the basically just different version of that data from different sources. And you're asking your salesperson basically figure out which one is the best. That's not a good way to make the data usable. You're making your sales team do too much work. So that's an, again, that's an example that yes, even after you make it good, make it, make it yours, how can you make the data much more usable for whoever has to use it? Excellent. Yeah, and I think um, some some real stories to add to what uh, the, the ones Ed already shared with you is like, one is I would say, just be careful with how you scope TAM versus SAM versus TRM. Like, in other words, get that focus down to the truly relevant market, right? Oftentimes, the benefit of that focus is tremendous on your ad targeting, on your lead routing, on your efficiency, on your uh, account scoring models. And, and when you really boil it down to something where you know you can win, where you know you have a great fit, a lot of times the, it's all about dialing in the right size market, given the team you've got. I see a lot of instances where people just are too broad. They want, you know, you, you get an excited team is like, oh my God, we can address everything in the market. Like that hurt, that works against you. That's a lack of efficiency. So don't make that mistake. Get it narrowed in to where you can really win and focus on it. Um, so that's that's the idea there. And I think, Ed, you had a couple of the real stories here on the right uh, that I'll let you quickly hit on. Yeah. So, uh, you know, this day and age, anybody who's got a budget can buy data, right? So don't, don't confuse that more data is always good. At the end of the day, if you can use it, uh, it's kind of worthless. And, you know, he, you know here's a good example. One of our customers, uh, you know, they when we first engaged with them, 
they have 750,000 account records in their Salesforce, right? And uh, if you look up, if you look up an account like like uh, USC, there's like 17 records of USC, and uh, you know that you can just imagine the amount of confusion and you know, for the sales team how hard it is to figure out which account to go after. Uh, you know they uh, this they really uh, this customer really decided to put a lot of effort into cleaning that up. Uh, after about you know about twelve months, they actually got it down to less than a hundred thousand records. Now just imagine your 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 sales force is actually uh, you know c- c- kind of gone through that kind of cleaning process where you went from seven hundred fifty thousand accounts to less than a hundred thousand accounts. Now just imagine how easy for your sales team to understand and actually go to market with that data. How how you know more actionable that is. And also, I think you probably have gotten the kind of hint already based on what we talked about so far. Uh, you know, when when people say data quality, uh, data quality usually uh, is a most people define it fairly narrowly, right? It's about accuracy, accuracy, recency, and completeness. But data quality is really much broader than you think, right? Again, until the uh, everything that has to do, for example, we talk about you know, make it yours. And all that aspect of it is really falls in a broader uh, sense of data quality. So, you know, we ask you to kind of think a little bigger when you think about qu- uh, good quality data, usable data. And it really has to do at the end of the day is the data that has the highest quality and enable your go to market, not just the kind of the basic technical definition of data quality. Cool. All right, let's move on to number two. Um, so, Number, uh, number two, and again, I, I, I'm sorry about the formatting here. Um, the number two is uh, ABX, your pipeline generation, right? So um, what this is all about is adding that intent data, right? And um, getting to the point where now you define that market. And when you add in enrichment and intent data, right, you're now able to get down to that subset of the market that's act either actively in market or you can help expand your ability to um, outbound it intelligently, right? This is the all bound motion, um, as well as enrich what you've got with, again, that combination of data sources that that Ed described. And so when you actually get to this, when you add this intent data, when you consider the enrichment capabilities out there, um, we're now able to get to the point where you've got uh, three different buckets of scoring for your marketing automation, right? Marketing activity itself, the account fit score, and the intent data, right? In our case, we've got the Bombora intent data. We also tend to use some sort of identity graph. The example here is Versium, right? That can take a contact data, leverage an identity graph. This is another source of knowledge to help make sure that you're able to t- use B2C data if you're a B2B provider to actually expand your ability to reach that particular target. And when you do this really well and also feed this knowledge to your outbound team, your BDRs or AEs directly, you can get a radical improvement in your inbound efficiency and an extremely good improvement in your um, outbound efficiency, right? So I just want to hit on this one and talk about really this is all about the addition of intent and enrichment for purposes of making your inbound and your outbound um, orders of magnitude more efficient and getting to that all bound motion. Um, so let me turn it over to Ed now and ask you the same question, right? What, how do you operationalize this in your framework of make it good, make it yours, make it usable? Yeah. So, so in terms of make it good, right? So, so James already uh, mentioned that you need to make sure you actually have good data in the first place, right? A lot of these uh, is data you will acquire. Now, also, once you acquire data, you also, in order to make sure it's good quality, you also have to make sure you can stitch them together properly, right? Again, this is even before you make it yours. And one good example is actually uh, this whole, in order for you to do, for example, to really understand a buyer's journey, which, you know, if you're doing ABX, you better be looking at buyer's journey, right? It's all about very focused, very targeted whale hunting type of tactics. So in order to do proper buyer's journey data, for example, at the very top of the funnel, uh, if you're a Marketo user, uh, you probably know Marketo has this little quirky quirkiness to it that it it only keeps the latest UTM tag. So you know if the uh, if the prospect have have filled out multiple forms before, then actually you lose the previous history. How do you actually take that first party data you get from Marketo the UTM, properly match it so it's stored 
actually within the uh, with, uh, within the campaign uh, country uh, campaign membership data. That is stuff that you also have to do yourself to make sure the basic quality is is good, right? And uh, James, uh, I know this the, the slide disappeared. Yeah, I think there were, we're refreshing it because we were okay. trying to fix that formatting real quick. So sorry if no problem. If, uh, no problem. So I'll keep on talking. So uh, you know, then talking about and uh, making it yours, right? Uh, one of the common thing we example we see in, uh, in ABX is people really want to understand the uh, the account hierarchy, the uh, the the you know, or a lot of the account family type of data being able to map that properly. So again, you can take a very kind of key account, target account type of approach, and this is again where you have to uh, you know make sure the data reflects your go to market. And for example, one of our customers, uh, they uh, you know, uh, if there's a Canadian audience in, in the audience here, uh, yeah. in the audience here, I'll apologize first. But uh, this company, for example, essentially treat Canada like the 51st state, right? They have this logic that, for example, for the U.S. Uh, for a U.S. Uh, company, the 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 domestic ultimate within U.S. will be the head of family. Now, same thing for Canada, but if the Domestic ultimate for the uh, for the Canadian company actually report is uh, actually has a parent in the U.S. They actually run the role that entire hierarchy under the U.S. company. Again, that's how they do business. I'm not going to argue with them what, whether that's geographically accurate or politically accurate, but that's how the go to market is structured, right? So again, this is all part of how do you structure your uh, account data to actually be able to support uh, you know your go to market in a way that's easy to consume and very productive, and Last item, you know, make it usable. Uh, this is where, again, how do you take this account data and make it so it's easy to consume? And for example, self-service list building. Uh, we mentioned earlier that one of the big challenges these days in terms of making data usable is that it's still very hard to get the data. And if you're in a kind of sizable company, most likely if you're on the field marketing, digital marketing, or sales team, you want to go ahead and run a campaign, you probably have to file a ticket. And the marketing ops team has to, for example, go to Marketo, Aliqua, build a list for you. You're going to have email flying back and forth with spreadsheets to verify the list looks okay. Then somebody, then they have to build a, a campaign for you. And two weeks later, another ticket shows up, kind of gets a metrics for the campaign I just run. There's no reason why the ops team needs to be that go-between in the middle, right? Can you make this, uh, this whole list building campaign uh, running exercise self-service? Sure, the uh, you know Marketo may not have the right UI to enable this, but what can you do in terms of other leveraging other technologies? Another thing, an example of making data more usable. So most companies, uh, you know, when when somebody moves from company to company, you you basically mark somebody who's no longer at that company and you create a new contact record, right? Which is good for a lot of kind of historical reporting and record keeping, but. When it comes to trying to figure out attribution analysis, behavior score, uh, uh, the uh, the uh, bias journey, then it, the person, the moment they move, is is a blank slate, which makes no sense if you think about it, right? So the, it may be a previous customer. You may have a very rich history of engagement with that person, but the moment they move company, you, you, you kind of lose uh, all that history. So ability to kind of even uh, create a single identity by linking all the contact data within your, your sales force. So your salesperson who's trying to understand what the history with his person is, so he can leverage all the information that he has when he tries to engage. How can you make that easier inside, for example, your sales force? So the your salesperson doesn't have to go through their own research, type in the person's name and, and try to see, you know, the three Ed King that showed up in Salesforce. Is this the same person or not? And uh, you know, what's the entire history? And also have to compare to, to uh, for example, my LinkedIn profile, right? How can you make that easier inside your sales force so your salesperson can prospect way more efficient when you're doing ABX? Yeah. Yeah, and so I think at this point, right, think about what we've just talked about in, in terms of the foundation of the data, right? Um, and then there we go. So yeah, so... <laughs> pardon me for the, the, the navigation here. You've got the data foundation. You've got the information on enrichment and intent you need to, to clean up that inbound and outbound motion to get to true ABX, right? Uh, Ed talked about the good, yours, usable. At the end of that conversation, he was starting to get into now, what you, you've established that foundation. Um, probably the hardest part of this is the next conversation, which is the hygiene, 
right? Um, how do you actually maintain that hygiene and really make sure that, um, you know, <laughs> all this work you've done is actually stabilized? So on number three, when we talk about good hygiene, right, there are, there are four areas of hygiene in terms of the data itself. And then how you operationalize this is really where things get, I think, most uh, complex and challenging, but it's also the most important dimension, right? Because as soon as that uh, value or, or hygiene breaks down, um, you lose the trust, you're kind of back to square one. Um, so I, I would say there's four things I'll mention here when it comes to the data itself. One is human verification. Um, so we at Sales Intel, for example, have a 2,000 person research on demand team that is in support of managing quality, right? Um, and so having that human verification on decision makers, having the ability to reach out when you see a job changer, for example, to recapture that knowledge so that you can take advantage of it is a super important part. And the number two is the research on demand. Technographics changes, right? A lot of the technographics data in the market, um, you've got to be real careful, right? There, it takes months to make a change. And so you have to have a lot more flexibility on that when two companies merge or when another um, a piece of software or techn technology emerges quickly. It happens a lot, right? The pace of change is more rapid than ever. So you need a more adaptable technographics layer, right? And you need, I think, the taxonomy and adaptability to change that in weeks, if not days, not months, right? So I'll move it over to Ed to talk about data hygiene. And I think this is where um, you know, we, we break a little bit from your rubric and double click on, uh, you know, uh, on hygiene itself, which is probably the biggest problem we all face. Yeah. So here, I think, I think, you know, there's three things I think, uh, may not be the most, may not be obvious to, to a lot of folks. And I want to make sure we, uh, we touch on this. So when it comes to, you know, maintaining good data hygiene, the first one is that it is a continuous effort. It's still shocking how many people think this is like just a one-time thing, right? Data deteriorates. 25% per year, right? It's like cabbage, right? And so that means if you don't keep it up, your database, you know, all that effort you put in initially, you have to repeatedly do it over and over again. And that's very expensive. So you absolutely need to maintain, uh, pro uh, deploy automation around uh, data hygiene. Now, a lot of folks also, the second point is that it's actually a distributed effort. A lot of companies go through the, the cycle that we see over and over again is that they start with, basically no control. Then they go to central control where the pendulum swing all the way to the other end, right? And then at the end, the, uh, and they figure out there's actually a middle ground where you have to actually have, get more people involved instead of just two, three people at the central ops team just does everything, right? To give, to give you a quick, quick example, Zendesk, one of our big customers, and I uh, just had a session at our user conference uh, uh, last week where they talk about, you know, years ago, Anybody can load a list into their Aliqua system. Just like wild, wild west. That got so bad, as you can imagine, then the ops team decided, you know what, we're going to have to shut this down. So basically, they said, there's only two people at headquarters that can load lists. Email your list. In. Quickly find out, we can't scale. And, and then it, uh, they spend some effort with our platform to build out an entire distributed self-service list building. Right? So you have to, in order to scale your data hygiene, data quality program, you really have to think about who has to get involved, especially the people who actually own the data? Can you actually push the work out to them with self-service and delegated administration capability? So, you know, while I just said automate everything, but automation is actually not enough if you're actually going to scale. Have to think about self-service and delegated administration. And the last thing here is, is, is all about the 80-20 rule. Uh, it's actually still amazing to see how many people try to get to perfection with that data. And this is a classic example is don't let profession be the enemy of great, right? And I don't know how many uh, companies I talk to that they almost get into a paralysis, which the, is, uh, the, is, uh, they, they want to avoid kind of the, our CMO likes to call it the walk of shame when something goes wrong, right? And, and you know, what, the reason why you get into that because you're not measuring, right? And then people go by anecdotal evidence, well, you screw up that record or that record is not right. And they don't see all the hundred other records that they own that magically got better, right? People, it's just human nature. So you have to have to measure. 
if you can actually measure the quality of your databases and be able to report that on an ongoing basis, and you can see, tell people, look, database actually improved by 50, 60% last year, right? Then they really have something that, then before they start complaining about that, that one record maybe, maybe got, got it wrong, you can actually have evidence that sure, you know, it's not perfect, but look how much progress we have made. And if you don't measure, it's really hard. You kind of constantly on a defensive when sales salespeople just complain. Yeah, and I think I would I would echo like a lot of this because I, for example, look at that continuous effort that twenty five percent per year. If you maintain hygiene on say a monthly cycle, right? You just review it. Now uh, that twenty five percent problem is a what a, a two percent problem per month, a three percent problem per month, um, and and. That mentality, I think, is so vital for hygiene because, again, if it, if you have this big bang launch on steps one and two that we just shared, and then six months into the project, the data's deteriorated substantially, now you've lost confidence again. Now, you, now people are like, "Hey, we did this whole project before. You told us how great it was. It looked good for a month. Now it's degraded again." So you just you just have to have that mentality and think of this as a you know keep it to a sub a single digit percent problem in any given thirty six day period. Don't let it scale to a point where you're kind of the engineering term would be refactoring all this. And then on distributed effort, I think I love the point about delegated administration. The area that I see so often as a CMO is the, the buy-in from the CRO and the sales team. Like think, just think about your, your CRM stages, right? Um, it's not always possible to fully automate that stuff. At some point, you got to force a human being to put that information in there, right? Um, the closed one reason, the closed loss reason, you can automate the fields, you can have metadata, right? But having that sort of discipline in the field as shared ownership, I, I think in distributed effort is a, is a really good example of what you have to commit to, right? A sales leader or a marketing leader that says, I want it all automated is probably, uh, you immediately got to do some education, <laughs> right? On what that really means and how much can be done through automation, Um and then, yeah, we all, on that 80-20 rule, we all find edge cases. I get edge cases. Oh, I hate the edge case, right? The salesperson, look at this. Look at this lead. It wasn't yours. It was outbound. All right? I, okay, it was one out of the 200 we generated this month. Does it fundamentally change the efficiency of go-to-market? No, right? We'll fix it. That's part of the, part of the, um, uh, you know, the, you know, continuous effort. But uh, just keep making sure that anecdote doesn't take over the big picture, right? So I love those points, Ed, thank you. And then let's, in the interest of time, I'm gonna to move to expert tip number four um, because it may be one of the mo most important um, part of it, which, so movers data, to me, I look at this movers data or job changer data as an outcome of the hygiene effort, right? And so that's why I wanted to really, you know, dwell on this for a moment and talk about, Ed, what you do, right, to help operationalize this for your customers, how Sales Intel fits in here, right, to help. Um, but it's really an outcome of hygiene, right? Yeah, it's a, it's actually probably, you know, we talk a lot about operationalizing data so far. This is probably one of the most, it's a very good illustration about why operationalizing matters, right? And, and so if you look at in order, so just so people, if people uh, don't understand what this process is, so, so you know, this is basically being able to uh, track your best customer or even prospect when they move from company to company, right? You know, in this envir economic environment where, you know, op, you know, efficient growth is the mantra now, you know, guess, guess who, who's most likely to buy from you again, your happy customers. So make sure you, you, when they move on, you track them, right? And how do you do that? So there are multiple, uh, the, the process involves multiple uh, kind of data sets and be able to make them actually work together for an end-to-end -end process. So for example, uh, of course, the, when people move on, the first place it usually shows up is that they update their LinkedIn profile. How can you detect that, that job change signal, right? Then once you have that signal, being able to actually compare to your CRM data and be able to detect, wait, you know, is my CRM data now out of, out of date? Do I already have this person's new uh, new job and company in the system, or do I have to create it? And if you do, then how do you actually update the old record and also create a new record and, and link them together? Right now, your your CRM picture data is coming into the picture. Now, so great, you detect that your champion has moved to a new company. Now, what are you going to do about it? You have to execute a, a sales playbook. 
this can uh, go from anywhere from notifying the account rep of the of the uh, the where the, uh, the 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 new company the person's gone to, and, or also be able to potentially actually launch a campaign in your marketing automation platform to start nurturing, and you know that 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 person even just basic hey congratulations on your new uh, new adventure right. And this is where you know I'll give a quick example of a of a you know the the where the operationalizing fails. So you know we, before we came out with the solution, we our own sales ops uh, person she tried to actually make this she just try to make this happen with the sales navigator. And guess what? Sales navigator will tell you that the person uh, you know has left the company, but it won't tell you where the person's going to. That's a classic example of I can't use that. Because guess what? The account account rep where the person left, she doesn't really care at the end of the day. The person that cares is the uh, the person who owns the new account. Unless you can tell me where the account is and notify that person, you haven't operationalized the data. And the last aspect of this is that now, uh, of course, person move, very likely you don't have all the new information, right? Now, how can you trigger a process to be able to get that information in real time, without having to just kind of sit on your hands and wait for maybe a couple of months for for the data showed up. So this is where a lot of the, the real time research on demand uh, capability that that comes in. So that's why we have integration with Sales Intel to actually provide that kind of real you know real time uh, enrichment when we detect somebody has moved. Yeah, yeah, and I think um, f- for me when I think about um, you know real stories around that data. Um, obviously there's the speed, but I think, think of those playbooks around three different dimensions, right? Um, dimension one is the one that everyone talks about most. My champion or my buyer has now gone to a new co. I'm, I have a new opportunity and that people seem to dwell on that one so much, um, that you for, sort of forget a couple of ele- other elements that need to be, uh, in the playbook, which is, your champion and buyer is now gone from an existing account. Like, what does that mean? They're going to hire someone in, right? Who might have come from a competitor. So you got to be defend. You've got to be thinking about it. I, I think that playbook both for the customer support, customer management side, as well as the new prospect side, and do it really effectively. And then the other thing that Ed mentioned, I, I'll tell you personally. Well, when I moved from my last company to this company, there was a gap of at least sixty to ninety days. I don't professionals like us, right, all of us on this call don't necessarily reveal on day one where we're at, right? You just, you're trying to find the uh, proverbial bathroom, right? So like you, the last thing you want to do is get that flood of inbounds that you know you're going to get as soon as you announce something on LinkedIn or, or whatever. Um, and, but, in, but you still want to be able to diagnose the fact that the move has taken place. You may not know and you may not be able to know where that where that champion or buyer has gone, but you can start to reach out, right? Hey, see you moved on or see you're moving. Um, really look forward to making sure we help you ramp up your next job. Whatever that play is, right, can, can be considered, or you can actually get the information before LinkedIn does. So the point is, I think that that speed and that sensitivity to those three realities I just described in your playbooks has got to be present. Um, and the only way you get to that point is the hygiene, right? And the and the and and the fundamental data you've got. Um, so I think um, I think that's great. Uh, anything more to add to this area in terms of real story? At, real stories that in terms of the movers and the this outcome of good hygiene. No, and this you know again is uh, you know the the build for this process is all I guess the speed is everything, right? So you you have to. You gotta understand if you wait long enough that the the, the situation may have may you know, may have changed. We actually have a, a personal story. Right, one of our customers, uh, you know, move on from one of our best accounts and, and to a new one, and we detected using this process. And you know, I literally called him up, said, "Hey, Jeff, congratulations. Uh, you know, how how are things?" And he's like, "Oh, yeah, you know, uh, I got one of your competitors' product here. It doesn't do half the stuff I want to do, but I don't have any budget yet, so I haven't called you." I'm like, do you know we're actually talking to your marketing team about an attribution project? Guess what? He literally walked over to the next office and that deal went immediately went from a head-to-head competition. We got a deal almost immediately, right? And if we have detected this in a couple of months, it'll be, it'll be too late. Yep. Yeah. Great, great, great example. Well, good. So then um, where we land is something that is, you know, I'm, I'm obviously very passionate about. And this is where how you get to the point where 
um, having done everything, these first four steps that Ed pro provided, right? You've got quality, actionable data, right? Third party like sales intel for everything you need, combining it with open source and, and, and of course your own first party data and the ways we described, making sure that it's an all bound motion using all of that data, right? Automation, you got the intent scores, you got the market fit scores. You've also got the, your own marketing activity, right? We used to just be in this world of marketing activity. Now we've got these new dimensions of data that you can combine for your marketing automation sophistication, as well as for prioritization of your outbound efforts, so BDR, AEs, right? Hygiene is a never ending um, journey, if you will, right? If you lose track of it, eventually you'll break down the whole process. All that value of, of, of steps one and two falls apart. And then of course the movers data, which is becoming paramount because we're, there's so much more rapid evolution of jobs and, and people moving in this environment. Um, but at the end of all that, right, really what you land on when you've done that really well is um, what we call the demand center. And I always use this example of who scored this touch, all right? We're in the middle of football season. This is last year's Super Bowl, as you recall. And with seconds left in the game, Cooper Cup caught the touchdown, right? That's the answer. Who, caught, who scored this touchdown? Cooper Cup. My point is, yeah, well, Matt Stafford threw him the ball, right? And the possession before the defense stopped them. The point is, this is where we get into it being a team sport. And ultimately, everything that Ed has guided us through lands on this concept of the demand center, where you can actually confidently align your team now, right? Um, and, 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 and come together as a go-to-market team, sales leadership, BDR leadership, marketing leadership, RevOps leadership, right? Have your ICP targets striped to your CRM, right? Which segment are we talking about today? Where are we seeing good performance in segment A versus segment B? Maybe we put more time there while we optimize this other segment that we know is a fit, but we're struggling with, right? How do we, how do we uh, map and route leads within that reality, knowing the size of the market, the number of contacts we have, to leverage, right? And then of course, there's the pipeline generation where um, we're not arguing anymore about, I need more inbound or I need more you to do more outbound, CRO, CMO. We're layering in financial data, right? That Ed can talk about in a moment and saying, what's most efficient for us right now, right? This isn't an argument between sales and marketing. This is about being efficient as a team. If, if marketing's getting efficient inbound, great spend more money on inbound, right? And hold your sales costs more constant and give people more pipeline. If marketing's inefficient right now and you're better off in the BDR layer or hiring an AE to do, you know, informed ABX outbound because that's more efficient and you're more of an, on an ABM strategy, then do that. But the point is you're having a discussion financially driven about the performance of, the, of go to market, right? Doubling down what's working, optimizing what's not working, right? Uh, and of course, the conversion. I love this one as well. Like conversions, like um, same type of thing. Are you know, the battle breaks out, but you start to have really intelligent conversations. Is our qualification or quality not good, or do we need better training for the sales team? Are we getting objections we can't handle? It's always one of those two issues. But which one is it becomes uh, a solution-oriented discussion. And then finally, uh, the measurement and optimization. Getting to the point where you trust the data where your C-suite is, is all aligned on what you're measuring, who's responsible for what and how you play together, as opposed to everyone showing up with a different view of the data. Well, my data says this, my data says that. Someone has to actually, um, we, you have to as a team through this process, align around that. How are you going to measure? How are you gonna report? Who's responsible for what? So this becomes possible, I think, in a way that's really, really empowering, meeting every week or two, for a 60 to 90 minute meeting where you're using data coming into that discussion and you're diagnosing and tearing apart the funnel as to what's getting better. So um, closing thoughts, Ed, anything to add to the demand center? And ultimately this is where we wanna land. We've got about five minutes left, so I wanna be sensitive. And thank you, by the way. I mean, that was awesome. I appreciate it. Yeah, no, just one comment on this. I think all you know, awesome points on this. Uh, on the revenue operations side, we're seeing more and more companies where the RevOps team actually start to break out from both under sales or under marketing and become uh, kind of independent team reporting to the COO or CFO, and for good reason, right? So it's uh, they they can not only help standardize the technology and data, 
but they're really kind of that 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 unbiased reporter, right? My theology I like to use that sales and marketing you know, in this political environment we're in can likely be the Democrats and the Republicans, right? And the RevOps thing is really kind of that that kind of unbiased media like NPR, right? That they'll take <laughs> the data, they'll be the honest reporters, they'll tell you what's actually what's not. And a big part of operationalizing your data is actually now you have ability to measure uh, you know, how you're doing and get that feedback loop going. And in this environment we're in, you know, when everybody chasing efficiency, you gotta squeeze that lemon really hard, right? And, and without ability to measure, you can't optimize. And without a build, without good data, there's no way you can measure. Yeah, yeah. So cool. So I think um, we went all the way up to the end, and I wanna uh, basically. I've noticed there's so, several questions, but I want to make sure everyone um, is assured of the fact that. Um, we will get back to you and answer your question. Every single question that we saw in the chat today, um, Ed or myself or both of us, if it's relevant to both of our points of view and expertise, we'll answer your questions. So I really appreciate those. And I want you to know, everyone to know that, um, you know, really pride ourselves in trying to add value and, and, and have these webinars with modern sales pros where you exit with practical things you can think about and do. Um, the deck will be available. This will be available on demand. If you've got someone on your team, you'd love to hear uh, have hear this. Um, and, you know, I want to thank you for your time and Ed for your time and Eduardo, I will at this point, you know, hand it back to you to close us out. Cause I know we've come on, come upon the end. Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, we have one question here from Tom that I think we have time to answer. Okay. Um, it's talking about uh, who should clean data. So he asks, who does this work? Do you have your BDRs uh, do the work or is it better to have an ops person acquire and clean the data before it gets to the BDRs? Uh, okay, I can take this one. Yeah, uh, I think that's a good one for you. And I have a perspective, but I want to hear you go first. <laughs> sales teams are not paid to clean data. If you count on your AE or SDR to clean data, you can keep on waiting. <laughs> it has to be somebody's job, which means it's either up or less desirably, uh, you know, folks on the IT side, frankly, that usually doesn't work well because they just don't understand your data. They understand technology. So yeah. you, this should be under the ops. Yeah, I agree. I think, I think, um, I think that the, uh, to double click a little bit on that, it's, um, there may be aspects of, of data rigor and hygiene that you need to train your BDRs and sales teams to do. I mentioned that they may have some responsibility, right. In the hygiene and the process, but that process and that responsibility should be, should come from an expert in, in this area. And if you, if you're not at the stage where you can hire someone full-time, there are, I mean, there are a lot of really, really good consultants that can get you started. Um, and then I see the follow-up question about the initial data capture, Tom, like, so I would say that, um, that's an example of when you have an outbound lead response, I would say the data capture should ideally already exist in your ops system, right? So that's what sales Intel helps do, for example, right? Now, when you get additional data, again, that becomes some responsibility and some training of the BDRs so that, that, initial, that, that they know, like as I learn more about that contact or that account, I've got a prescribed way to um, you know, get that information recorded standardized, right? And so that's how I would think about that. But in terms of initial data capture, if you just have a purely outbound motion, um, you're probably better off thinking about stepping back and having one less BDR or one less rep and getting core data into the system because of the efficiency you could get from that in the rest of the team, as opposed to relying on all your outbound team to get that data. So I don't know if that's the situation you're in. We can certainly talk to you about that directly if you want, but that's how I would build on what Ed said. Awesome. I think that's a great answer. I think Tom will be very happy about it. Uh, just like tweet length uh, thoughts in here because we have the poll, 25% uh, of our poll respondents said they have no idea uh, what operationalizing their data means. Uh, Ed, do you have like a 30 second thought for those 25% of uh, full responders? I mean, uh, you're not alone. It's, uh, this is actually <laughs> data, data uh, you know, uh, is still a fairly new uh, new thing for the ops team, right? There's, uh, the RevOps as a profession collectively, we're kind of all growing up together. 
kind of building uh, uh, a kind of kind of repertoire of best practices and uh, you know kind of body of work, if you will. So, and data is an area, frankly, sometimes you know uh, you know it's uh, we feel like we're the only vendor out there telling people data work is actually hard, right? But it is absolutely. I mean, it's hard. It may not be sexy, but guess what? It's foundational, and literally nothing works well without it. So it's an investment. Well, you know, you'll find that it's it's a it's an investment well spent. Yeah. Yep, and that's why sales intel is here for it, right? Absolutely. <laughs> yep, I, I agree. Yeah, it's it's um, again, I'm a customer customer turned CMO, and it, it core quality data at scale, operationalized well, makes um, if it, again, if you're struggling with budgets, right? Think about uh, you know, a more efficient all bound motion is going to come from good operations and data. It's going to, it's such a radical improvement that having one less outbound resource, which feels hard can pay off for you. I, that's the thing that I, I would emphasize you that it, it, having that efficiency in that core data and knowing your target market and what the size is and what, when they're showing intent, it's just, it's, it's, it's there. The market has it. Right. And so, and, to struggle on your own and just keep hiring outbound that, that can, that can be very inefficient and very, very hard when everyone else that you're competing with has this leg up on intelligence because they've just simply acquired the data and operationalized it in the way we described. So hmm. something to think about. Awesome. Thank you so much. Right. <clears throat> we are going to wrap things up in here. If you are interested in any of those offers that are on the screen right now from Sales Intel, make sure to click on the request demo button at the top of this page and the Sales Intel team will get back to you pretty soon with some offers. Um, I want to say thank you audience for attending. Happy Monday. Thank you for joining us. I hope this event uh, brought you some energy to go through the week. Uh, we love having you here. You are the best power MSP. Uh, thank you, James and Ev, for all the knowledge you share. This was fantastic. I think people really have like some action items to go and implement this week. Um, uh, thank you for the wonderful Sales Intel for sponsoring this event. They are doing amazing stuff, so make sure to check their website, uh, request a demo at the top of this page. And while the panelists and I hang out backstage, the MSP team will make sure that the recording is available in our website pretty soon, so you can go back and watch everything and take notes again and share the recording with everyone. So uh, panelists, we can say bye to our audience and go backstage. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Ed. Thank you. Thanks, Eduardo.